from the very moment that first trailer dropped. It was obvious to everyone that Stranger of Paradise Final Fantasy Origin would go down in history as a bit of a joke. Except that it didn't, because Stranger of Paradise is the best kind of comeback, the one you didn't even see coming. Stranger of Paradise had probably the worst announcement trailer of all time. But in some weird way, it was also the best introduction the game could have possibly gotten. Because Stranger's announcement trailer did something no amount of traditional marketing could ever do. It generated enough memes to power the game into the eyes of mainstream gaming. But the announcement trailer did more than just generate memes. It also managed the expectations of Final Fantasy's fanbase. After all, no one who saw that first trailer in June of 2021 could possibly be disappointed in the final product. And by the time the first gameplay trailer hit three months later, something kind of magical was starting to happen. Stranger of Paradise didn't look totally terrible. The more we learned about the game, the more it started to look like a legitimate title. Maybe not a mainstay Final Fantasy game, or a classic action game like Neo, but something that took a bit of both and offered something new. A tribute to the Final Fantasy series in the shape of a Souls-like action RPG. Stranger of Paradise started to look like an underdog story. A game that could take people by surprise. I've personally never been so hype for a game that started out looking so bad. And with expectations so low, things could only get better from here. Stranger of Paradise Final Fantasy Origin is a third-person action RPG with a strong emphasis on the action part. You control a single character backed up by two NPC allies as you fight your way through fast-paced battles set in elaborate dungeons inspired by other Final Fantasy titles. You wield weapons, spells, and signature abilities from the Final Fantasy series, equip and combine jobs from its famous job system, and battle all sorts of familiar foes. Graphically, the game hardly pushes the hardware to its limits, not even on a PS4. The strongest part is probably the game's environments, and some of the places you visit can look rather pretty like this forest area with its vibrant colors and dramatic contrast between sunlight and rain. And the game's various monsters look generally fine, just not impressive. The same cannot be said for another major area of the game's graphics. Stranger of Paradise uses Final Fantasy's trademark brand of fake-looking faces, realism with a plastic feel, as opposed to something more cartoony like Xenoblade Chronicles. But while mainline Final Fantasy titles benefit from extremely generous budgets that make the games and the people inside them look absolutely gorgeous, Stranger of Paradise's faces feel cheap. Some of them are definitely better than others. Jack, Jed, Ash, and Princess Sarah all look fairly good, but a lot of the supporting cast, like the King of Cornelia and Princess Mia, are straight up Uncanny Valley nightmare fuel. Stranger looks and feels like a budget title, but when the game really tries, it can do some pretty great things. The intro movie, which shows Garland abducting Princess Sarah from Cornelia Castle, is menacing, brutal, and evocative, and a great taste of things to come. But the best thing about Stranger's intro is not how it looks. It's something much more fundamental to the Final Fantasy series the one part of Stranger of Paradise that never fails to impress. Not all games that bear the Final Fantasy name are great achievements, but there is one thing they all have in common. A great soundtrack. As you'd expect from a game that celebrates Final Fantasy's 35th anniversary, Stranger of Paradise draws a lot from the franchise's rich treasure chest of music. The game's various stages all pay tribute to the games that came before. The Lair of the Water Fiend draws inspiration from Final Fantasy VII's Underwater Reactor, and the Crystal Tower obviously evokes Final Fantasy III's landmark Final Dungeon. But Stranger of Paradise is not a slave to the past. The game's soundtrack is not just a bunch of lazy remixes. Instead, 
subtle elements from the original compositions are skillfully woven into the new songs. The influences are restrained rather than gratuitous, strong enough to delight the fans, but with a soft enough touch that it doesn't erase the game's own identity. And the soundtrack isn't all about nostalgia. The new compositions are just as good. The main theme is dramatic and foreboding, and the battle theme feels like an instant classic. The soundtrack is worthy of the Final Fantasy name, and that's saying a lot. And it really does what it's designed to do. It draws you into the experience and enriches the gameplay, especially that core aspect of the gameplay that Stranger of Paradise is all about. The whole reason anyone would play this game in the first place. The combat. Stranger of Paradise is an action RPG, and the game has lots of RPG elements like gaining levels, upgrading your equipment with loot that drops from monsters and treasure chests, and a skill tree to work your way through. But this is first and foremost an action game. And while your stats matter a lot, they're not the most important thing. A skilled enough player could beat the whole game without taking a single hit, and no amount of gear is gonna help you beat the game's bosses if you can't learn their patterns. The game is developed by Team Ninja and borrows a lot of its basic DNA from the Neo series. You fight using combinations of different attacks based on your equipped weapon, and combat's all about spacing and timing and exploiting the enemy's weak points. Just like you, enemies have a life bar and a break gauge, and you can either cut your enemies to shreds with raw damage or shatter their guards with brutal break attacks to trigger an instant kill soul burst. Combos and special abilities cost MP, which you get from playing well. And the more MP you have, the crazier the combinations you can pull off in combat. It's basically a momentum mechanic, meaning the better you play, the more fun the fighting gets. Mastering combat means mastering defense. You can block ordinary attacks by holding the guard button, but blocking too much will break your guard. Soul Shield lets you absorb magic attacks, but empties your break gauge in moments if you spam it. And some unblockable attacks can only be evaded by dodging. Proper defense means knowing when and where to use which tool. And some of the most fun I've had with the game was in finding that perfect rhythm that turns a boss fight into an intricate dance. Stranger's signature feature is its implementation of Final Fantasy's famous job system. You start the game with access to eight basic jobs, including Swordsman, Lancer, and Mage. As you defeat monsters and gain experience, you'll earn job points that let you unlock new combos, abilities, and more advanced jobs. Each job comes with a special job action, like the Dragoon's Jump and the Black Mage's Black Magic as well as its own set of combos and special abilities to master. There's a total of 28 jobs to unlock, and a lot of the fun in the game comes from working your way through the job tree and trying out all of the shiny new toys you unlock along the way. The best thing about the job system is just how modular it is. Although some perks and abilities are unique to a certain job, most of the stuff you unlock can be used across the board. And while each job has restrictions on the types of weapons they can equip, the weapons themselves aren't tied to any one job. For example, the Dragoon's signature weapon is obviously the Lance, but in Stranger of Paradise, they can fight just as well using axes and two-handed swords. So when you switch to Dragoon from Marauder, you can keep using your favorite weapon and all of the combos you've already unlocked. Instead of locking you into a single job at any one time, the game lets you equip two battle sets that you can switch between with the press of a button. Being able to switch jobs is great, but it wouldn't do you much good if the game didn't give you a good reason to do so. Fortunately, Stranger's Design gives you two very good reasons to switch jobs in combat often. First, by switching jobs at just the right moment, you can cancel out of long animations to dodge a nasty blow or extend your attack. And secondly, each of your battle sets comes with its own break gauge, so clever job switching is pretty much essential to defending against the most powerful attacks, especially at higher difficulties. 
but some of the game's other mechanics feel less thought out. The Sage's defining feature is the ability to build stacks of magic seals which make casting spells of the same color quicker, and eventually lets you unleash the powerful Ultima spell. But all of your seals are wiped out when you switch between battle sets, so the Sage doesn't play very well with other jobs. And the same can be said for the Paladin's Holy Fang buff, which doesn't transfer across a job switch. Another missed opportunity is how the game handles shared resources. Combos, spells, and command abilities all use MP, so you'll have to think carefully about what you're going to spend it on. Since MP is usually in short supply, I often felt stifled in combat, focusing mostly on my go-to combos and spells and ignoring the more situational abilities. I'm not saying the design is broken, I'm just saying it's not very fun. Still, Stranger of Paradise's job system is easily the game's best feature, and it's honestly one of the coolest implementations of the job system ever. Unlocking new skills and powers, experimenting with different weapons and abilities, and unleashing the game's full arsenal on hordes of monsters in high-octane combat can be crazy fun. The sheer number of options at your disposal is staggering, and I love how you can smash your face against a fight over and over with one loadout, then come back with a different set of weapons and abilities to get the victory. It all really puts me in the mood of Final Fantasy V, and that's definitely a good thing. I really started to have a good time about halfway through the game's first stage, and by the time I beat the first boss, I was hooked. My only real beef with combat is when you have to fight those big alien mouth things that block the way forward and keep spitting out monsters. I guess they're called dark vents? The room keeps filling up with monsters, but there's no point to fighting them since the dark vent will just summon more. And they all die anyway once the dark vent goes down, so the winning strategy is just to ignore everything and focus down the dark vent, which I just think is boring. Which brings us to what is arguably the weakest part of Stranger's gameplay. And as much as a good combat system can make or break an action game, there's still another piece of the puzzle you need to make it great. Level design. The world of Stranger of Paradise is carved up into a mission-based structure, with a map-like main menu serving as the game's central hub. While the world map format is fine, it mostly feels like a half-hearted callback to Final Fantasy 1. There is the option to talk to NPCs in the town of Cornelia, but the dialogue is boring and the information they give is pretty much useless. It's an obvious nod to the original game, which is kind of ironic since Final Fantasy 1 used its NPCs to guide the player through the game. Here, the feature feels completely pointless. When it comes to the actual missions, Stranger of Paradise's level design feels underwhelming. The environments are pretty to look at, but there's not a lot of detail to the spaces or stuff to interact with. There's the occasional pillar to topple or wall to destroy before you can move forward, but even these are few and far between. The closest thing to an innovative stage the game has is probably the Refrain Wetlands, which features these orbs you can activate to shift the weather from sunshine to heavy rain or back again. This opens up new paths, but also dramatically changes the look and feel of the stage, which is pretty cool, though it has to be noted that this mechanic is taken straight from the stage's inspiration, Final Fantasy XIII's Sunlit Waterscape. Most of the levels do have some secrets to find, which usually means bonus treasure and sometimes bits of lore that help explain the game's story. And some of these hidden areas do take a bit of effort to reach, forcing you to pay close attention to the environment or use fire and other magical abilities to clear the path. Sometimes you can even use the environment to your advantage in combat. You can knock enemies into walls to deal extra break damage or shove a monster off a cliff to send them off for good but you'd better be careful because you too can fall off the edge, and this can be as hilarious as it is annoying. Especially when it means falling to a lower floor and having to redo a lot of the stage. And the stages can take a while to finish. Main missions are pretty long, usually taking about an hour to clear the first time around, plus whatever time you need to actually beat the boss. The levels are large, 
with lots of twists and turns and enough side rooms and hidden locations to keep you engaged. Something unusual the game does that I actually really like is the fact that there's no minimap or waypoints to guide you through the stages. Gaming's obsessive reliance on heavy-handed GPS instructions to deal with pathfinding is something of a pet peeve of mine, and I'm pleased to find that having to do without it really added a lot to my experience with the game. You have to really pay attention to the environment and learn to recognize different landmarks to avoid getting lost. Sometimes you gotta do a bit of backtracking to find a path forward, and it gives the game a feeling of exploration and adventure you don't often see in games like this. But the length and complexity of the stages isn't always a benefit. While the main missions feel fresh and fun the first time you see them, I can totally see myself going out of my mind running the same basic stages over and over when grinding for gear. Stranger of Paradise's levels do their job of setting the stage for the core gameplay of brutal action-based battles, but they're not very immersive or atmospheric, and there's really not much in the level design that stands out from the norm. There are some nice ideas here and there, but nothing feels fresh or new, and the overall feeling I got from the stages is world-building on a budget. And while I wasn't really expecting that much from the game, it's still a valid criticism. Some of the game stages are better than others, and my favorite stage in the game has gotta be the Terra Tortura, if only for the burst of nostalgia I get from seeing Final Fantasy VI's famous floating continent rendered in hideous, fleshy 3D. With all that said, when it comes to long levels and splashy bosses, there is one big topic we have to discuss. After all, Stranger of Paradise is technically a Souls-like title, and that means there's a question that needs to be asked. How hard is it? I gotta be honest, I don't have a whole lot of experience with the Souls-like genre. I never really got into Dark Souls, and I only tried the original Neo after finishing Stranger of Paradise. But I can now say with perfect confidence that Stranger of Paradise is a challenging game, but when you compare it to Team Ninja's own Neo, it's not even close. Neo is a hard game. The very first enemy killed me three times, the first real stage took me hours to get through, and I still haven't been able to beat the first boss. And right now, I honestly don't know if I'll ever be able to. It's a frustrating, demoralizing, and totally maddening game, and I love it. Stranger of Paradise is a very different experience. It's a more casual, action-oriented game. You don't have to be as deliberate or as tactical as in Neo, and the game is a lot more forgiving, but it still shares that basic core design philosophy that says pay attention or die. Many attacks can one-shot you if you're not being careful. You'll spend a lot of time fighting groups of monsters, so a keen sense of your surroundings is a must, and some combinations of enemies can be really tough to take on. But the biggest difference between Stranger of Paradise and other Souls-like titles is in how the game deals with death. In Stranger of Paradise, dying is cheap. Checkpoints called cubes are placed at generous intervals throughout the stage, and there's always a checkpoint right before the boss. The strength of your character is based almost entirely on the equipment you wear, and all of that stuff's permanent. No matter how badly you're doing, as long as you're at least killing a few monsters here and there, you'll just keep getting stronger. But that doesn't mean the game is a total pushover. I died a lot in my playthrough of Stranger of Paradise. The game can be punishing if you're not finding the right rhythm, but it's also incredibly satisfying when you get it right. Figuring out a boss, solving a certain group of enemies, or pulling off a perfect chain of attacks to take a nasty monster from zero to death and soul crush it can be an absolutely thrilling experience. And by far, the best time I had with the game outside of multiplayer was when I ran into my first wall. Stranger of Paradise is the kind of game that teaches patience. And for me, this was more true than ever when I went up against Tiamat. I think I died about 30 or 40 times before I got it right, and in the end it all came down to patience. Paying attention and learning the boss's patterns 
knowing when to block and when to soul shield, when to retreat and when to advance, and having a sense of timing for when you could sneak in a brutal blow during a brief window of weakness. Adapting to the fight rather than trying to force my preferred playstyle. And even then, a single mistake can send you back to the last checkpoint. And that's where patience is more important than ever, because these games are supposed to be hard, and it's all about keeping your spirits high between tries and leaning into the challenge. And when you finally get that perfect run, when you've earned the right to beat the boss, it's super satisfying, like hitting the same wall that stopped you before, and this time exploding through the bricks to the other side. In the end, Stranger of Paradise is a more lenient type of game than something like Neo. But if you want a challenge, there are ways to get that. You could activate hard mode. You could leave your companions at home and take on the stage with Jack alone. You can equip first level gear and fight your way through the dungeon wearing nothing but rags. Or you could challenge yourself to a no damage run. And once you beat the game, you unlock Chaos Mode, where you can earn Anima Crystals to unlock harder and harder versions of the now familiar stages. And if you're looking for an even more casual experience, there's always Story Mode. But there is a better and more fun way to experience Stranger of Paradise at a slower pace and reduced difficulty. And for this one, you don't even need to change the game's settings. All you need to do is invite a friend or two. In many ways, Stranger of Paradise feels almost designed around multiplayer. The game's focus on fighting groups of enemies at the same time feels like a natural fit for joining forces with friends. Your attacks become automatic critical hits if you strike your enemy from behind, which makes tanking or kiting monsters a legitimate strategy. And the white mage can make a whole career out of buffing its allies with spells like Haste, Protect and Shell. At the same time, even though the stages you explore and the monsters you fight stay very much the same, switching to multiplayer can feel like a totally different experience. Because the biggest difference between playing with friends and playing alone is just how much easier multiplayer is. Part of it is that you just get more out of your human allies. Players make better tanks than the NPC companions, and they also tend to do a lot better in combat. But the biggest drop in difficulty comes from the way dying works in multiplayer. In single player, getting knocked out is an instant game over. In multiplayer, you can use your potions to revive your fallen allies. And even better, the party has a shared pool of phoenix down which can be used to instantly revive without the aid of another player. All of this adds up to a huge boost in survivability, especially in boss battles. Some of the bosses feel almost trivial in multiplayer, while others are still fairly challenging, but none of them are nearly as hard as when you face them offline. Multiplayer can feel at times like the intended way to play the game, but then there are those weird restrictions that make you feel like multiplayer might have been a last minute feature tacked onto a single player game. Whoever hosts the game is forced to play as Jack, even though it really makes no difference since all of the cutscenes include the whole party anyway. Worse, only Jack can soul burst bosses and dark events, which gets pretty stupid at times. And then there's the irritating fact that two players cannot interact with the same object at the same time, which leads to some really annoying situations when you're both trying to climb a ladder, open a chest, or activate cubes. But the worst part of the multiplayer experience is when the game forces you back into single player because several stages of the game can only be played on your own. And this includes the final boss. When you're having a good time with a friend, it just sucks to have to split up to do missions alone. And not being able to see the game through to the end as a team really sours an otherwise great experience. Of course, there's a perfectly valid reason why those missions have to be played alone and it has to do with the part of the game that ended up taking me most by surprise. The part that was supposed to be an absolute disaster. On the surface, Stranger of Paradise is a story about the pain of remembering, the horror of forgetting, and the courage to rebel against tyranny. But ultimately, this is really a story of wasted potential.
and the most surprising thing about the game is how I felt about the story in the end. Having seen the game's trailers, I went into Stranger expecting the story to be hilariously bad. And to be fair, it kinda starts out that way. The characters are tired cliches, the voice acting is fine, but the dialogue is beyond terrible at times. And some of the scenes are so dumb, you have to believe that the writers are trolling you. At first, it's honestly hard to tell if the story is meant to be taken seriously or not. But the further I got into the story, the less it seemed like a big joke. And the more I started to get the feeling that all of this is actually meant to be totally sincere. It just doesn't do a good job of conveying that. Because Stranger of Paradise has a problem with storytelling. For an 8-bit game that turns 35 in December of this year, Final Fantasy 1 had a remarkably complicated story centered on a very confusing time loop. Stranger of Paradise essentially provides an origin story for the entire Final Fantasy franchise. By introducing the central problem of darkness and light, the corrupting force of chaos, and the Lufinian's plan to maintain balance. But Stranger of Paradise really struggles to get that story off the ground. The game has a great mystery to tell, but it gets way too clever in trying to do so. And in the process, it ends up breaking the very engine of the story. The stuff a story needs to make you care. To draw the audience into a story, you need emotional investment. And that comes from empathy. Not necessarily being able to relate to a character, but rather being able to put yourself in their situation and understand their feelings. And to get that, you need to be told through words, actions, or subtle cues what the character might be feeling. Stranger of Paradise is pretty much a case study in how not to draw the audience into a story. The game is all about the quest to kill chaos, but this is just an illusion. A fiction created by the Lufinians to keep the strangers on track. Instead, the real conflict is with the Lufinians who use the strangers as tools, routinely wiping their memories for another shot at the perfect solution. But instead of letting the audience in on this perfectly compelling conflict, the game hides it beneath impenetrable vagueness and only reveals it right at the end when it's too late to care. The game seems absolutely terrified of telling us anything that might give the secret away, and it hurts the story a lot. Instead of showing us who the characters really are, the game tries to build suspense. The heroes have conversations that make almost no sense because the context of their relationships has been deliberately hidden from you. And when it should be advancing the plot, the game spends hours retreading the same tired ground. There are so many cutscenes that do nothing to advance the story. The strangers are lost and confused, stuck in a circular pattern of remembrance and oblivion. But for a lot of the game, the heroes are sleepwalking through the adventure, without ever letting the audience in on the fact that they don't really know what they're doing. Stranger of Paradise feels like watching a murder mystery where they don't actually tell you that somebody died until the end of the story. You just watch the detectives go around asking people random questions without ever mentioning that someone was killed. The game keeps you starved for information when it should be dropping hard-hitting revelations that open up new questions. That's how you build a mystery. Not by constantly teasing the same tired question over and over without adding anything new. Stranger of Paradise takes a lot of time to get off the ground. And the saddest thing is that when it finally gets to the point, the story's actually pretty good. There's some serious payoffs to the game's biggest plot twists. But it all falls so flat when there's been no real build-up. Near the end of the game, we learn that Jack's four companions have pieced together their memories before him, and have been working to prepare him for that final push of rebellion, even at the expense of their own lives. It's a really cool twist, but it comes out of nowhere, because the foreshadowing was so subtle, it might as well not have been there. Imagine if this had been signposted with hints of betrayal, making us wonder 
if Jack's allies are really on his side. The final revelation would have been so much more compelling if they'd taken the time to build some suspense. The game has these moments that could have been great if they'd just done their groundwork. The death of Astos would have hit really hard if they developed his relationship with Jack over time, instead of cramming it all in right at the end. Losing Sarah would have hurt if we'd gotten a chance to actually care about her, and Jack would have been so much more likable if we'd gotten to see how much he cares before the end of the game. Because sad Jack is a hell of a lot more interesting than angry Jack. Storytelling is really the art of information management, and keeping the wrong secrets can totally break a story. Much of the game's mystery prevents us from getting to know the heroes, and I honestly feel like the state that they're in at the end of the game is where they should have been at the start. Passionate, determined, and hellbent on making a difference. It took me forever to fall for these characters, and by the time I was hooked, the story was over. Too little, too late. Stranger of Paradise could have been so much more than a meme. It could have been a legitimately great story. But even so, the game can still teach us a very important lesson. Because Stranger of Paradise shows, better than almost any game before, the awesome power of low expectations. Before I go on, I just want to say if you enjoyed this video, I'd be super grateful if you could hit the like button and leave a quick comment, as it really helps the video reach more people. And if you want to support me, consider subscribing to my channel so I know people want to see more videos like this. One of my favorite comedies of all time is the original Hangover. Not because it's the best or funniest, but because of my low expectations. I must have seen the trailer a hundred times while watching live TV, and it just seemed so dumb. But when I finally caved and ended up seeing it, it was so much more funny than I'd ever expected. I had a great time because I had no expectations. Stranger of Paradise demonstrates the same power of low expectations. When the game was first announced, I honestly thought it was a joke. Watching that trailer, I couldn't stop laughing. It gave the impression that Stranger of Paradise was a dumb, rushed, hack job of a spin-off title. A shallow, cynical cash grab that draws just enough material from the original Final Fantasy to trick faithful fans into buying the game. But I was totally wrong. Almost two years ago, I made a video talking about which Final Fantasy game would be the next to get a proper remake after Final Fantasy VII. In that video, I quickly dismissed the original Final Fantasy as a viable candidate. So imagine my surprise when Stranger of Paradise Final Fantasy Origin was announced. But this isn't a remake of the original game. It's a roller coaster road trip through the whole freaking franchise, full of callbacks and neat little tributes. A love letter to Final Fantasy as a whole. You fight morbles and quarrels, bombs, sahagins and flans. You take on the behemoth, the iron giant and the ultima weapon. And hunting down tonberries and cactuars has seriously never been this much fun. It's just such a treat to see all of these familiar spells and abilities realized in a great action game. Black mages sling firagas and thundagas, dragoons leap through the air with their jump ability. Sages annihilate monsters with the power of Ultima. Liberators get Mighty Guard, and there's Runic, Holy, Flair, and Zantetsuken. They even manage to integrate my favorite Final Fantasy mechanic of all time, Blue Magic, in a really cool way. And I would honestly love to see a future Final Fantasy build on this concept of absorbing magic and hurling it back at the enemies. Stranger of Paradise is a celebration of Final Fantasy, but more importantly, it's a really fun game. It's a game on a budget, full of flaws and lazy design, but at its core, it's got a great combat system, tons of customization, and enough material to make you feel like you got your money's worth, even if you never touch the game after killing Chaos. Let's be honest though, I never would have bought this game in the first place if it didn't have the Final Fantasy name. 
but it's a fun way to celebrate Final Fantasy's 35th anniversary, a fantastic gateway into the Neo series, and a great game to scratch that itch while waiting for Final Fantasy 16. It's far from a perfect game, but who cares? Not all games need to be all things to all people. And with the right expectations, as long as the effort is earnest, even a modest game can be a lot of fun in the right hands. In the end, Stranger of Paradise is a game about the chaotic chaos that comes from the call to kill chaos in the Chaos Shrine's chaotic corridors before Chaos's chaotic compulsion catapults the kingdom into complete chaos. And these are just my personal opinions. Whether you agree or disagree, chaos, I'd love to hear more about your experiences with Stranger of Chaos, Final Fantasy Origin, in the chaos below. Thank you so much for chaos, and have a great day!